Hello, my philosophic friends, and welcome to episode number 16 of Patterson in Pursuit. You guys are probably tired of hearing me say this, but I am so excited about this interview. This is another one of my favorites ever. Today, I'm asking the foundational question, what is logic? And to help me answer this question, I spoke with Dr. Timothy Williamson, who is the Wycam Professor of Logic at Oxford University. We spend a lot of time talking about the nature of logic, the constraints of logic, paradoxes and contradictions in logic, and we also get in some really interesting discussions about the metaphysics of concepts and mathematics. If you have an appreciation for logic, I can bet the farm that you are going to love this interview. Dr. Williamson is the author of several books, most recently a book called Tetralogue, I'm Right, You're Wrong, which is a fictional conversation that takes place on a train between four people. I'll have a link to that book at the show notes page this week, which is steve-patterson.com slash 16. And shortly, I will also put up a link to my upcoming book, Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge, which is specifically on this topic as well. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Timothy Williamson of Oxford University. So first of all, thank you very much for sitting down and speaking with me today. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, I have several questions for you because as somebody who's interested in philosophy, I think that logic is a really big deal. And I think this is kind of universally understood in pretty much every area of thought. People treat logic with a great deal of respect. And they say things like, oh, you're not being logical. And that's supposed to mean, no, you've made a big error. Um, but when you try to ask the question, well, what is logic? you get a lot of different answers. Some people say, well, logic is the rules for reasoning, or it's the rules of thought, or it's the rules of existence. There's lots of different interpretations and explanations um, try to identify what logic is. In your own worldview, what do you think logic is? Well, logic is actually several things because it, it's studied in, in, in different areas uh, for uh, different purposes. I mean, studied in philosophy, it's studied in mathematics, it's studied in computer science. Um, and uh, of course, all, all those people have d different aspects of it, which they find most interesting. But f from my point of view, as a philosopher, the, the most uh, fundamental part of logic is really just concerned with very, very broad structural uh, generalizations about how things are. So it, it, it is just as much concerned with, with reality as, as any other kind of investigation, but just at this very abstract structural level. So we're interested in principles like everything either is the case or is not the case. So it's basically the law of excluded metal and that sort of typical law of logic. So when you say um, you're concerned with kind of would you say your logic is has to do with principles of existence in the most abstract form? Is that would that be fair? Yeah, to you say? could say you could you could say existence just in the sense of 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 what there is and and how it is um, and um, it you know I think in some ways it's uh, mathematics is a bit like that, but l logic has. Uh, is, is concerned with with even more fundamental uh, kinds of generalizations about uh, uh, how things are, and it's. I mean, people talk about it as the laws of of thought, but I, I think it's really that uh, it's. I mean, if you, it's not so different from a subject like physics. I mean, the, the, the physics isn't really concerned with. The, the laws of thought, it's concerned with, with physical reality. But then, of course, if you know something about physical reality, that tells you how you ought to think about physical reality. And in the case of, of logic, I think it's, it's similar that uh, it's not primarily concerned with giving us instructions about how to think. But if, if you do know something about the, the sort of broadest uh, structural features of reality, that should constrain the way that you think in the same way that any other knowledge should. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of questions that are evoked by that response. One of them you say, uh, at the beginning you said, you know, it's studied by a lot of different areas of thought. I think that is certainly the case. But does that imply that it's just one thing, that there's just one logic out there and there's different approaches pointing at the same thing? Or are there different logics out there? Well, there are, there are different logics in, in various senses. I, I mean, th there are, of course, just as 
in physics, there are different physical theories. I mean, in, in logic, there are different logical theories. Um, some of those are, clash with each other. I mean, some of them are, are, are rival theories of the same subject matter. Uh, others are, are not really rivals at all. They're just concerned with answering different different questions. So it's, it's, I mean, there's a lot of variety within logic so itself. It's, it would be true to say that there's different logics um, kind of from an academic standpoint, that there's different claim, there's different competing claims to what logic is. But well, my or different, the different theories about, uh, about logic, if you like, about logical reality. Um, but what I'm, so the question perhaps not necessarily about the fact that there are different competing claims about logic, but this idea that there are in reality multiple logics. So you have like a, like a pluralistic logical framework that you have your logic, somebody else has their other logic, another culture has another logic. What do you think about that idea? I'm not a pluralist about logic. It seems to me that the, uh, the questions, the, the most fundamental questions that we're, we're asking have, have right and wrong answers. And if, if two people are giving in, inconsistent answers to a question, then um, at least one of them is wrong. Isn't that an application of, let's say, classical logic? So what you're saying is something like, um, if, if two propositions contradict one another, one's got to be, well, at least one of them is wrong, is, is fair to say. Yes. But isn't that only true within your framework of classical logic? Well, th that, that is a, a claim that classical logic make. It's, it's, it, I mean, it's not a claim that absolutely everybody uh, accepts, but um, the, the fact that some people disagree with it doesn't make it false or, or doesn't even make it anything other than absolutely true. So then what do you think? I completely agree, by the way, with everything you just said. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Um, I had an, an interview at Columbia University where I was talking to a gentleman about this topic, and he was a dialetheist where the, like the grand priest version mm -hmm. of there are some true contradictions that you just have to accept. Things are, it is not the case that everything is true or false. There are some exceptions. So you, you would say you, don't, you, you think there's an error in that way of thinking. Yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm not a, di a dialetheist. I, I think that uh, when somebody contradicts themselves, something is going, going wrong. Um, I think dialetheism, it's an, it's an interesting view because uh, it, it's not just a completely irrational sort of reaction. It, it's, uh, it is a way of attempting to, to deal with, with certain kinds of paradoxes which uh, result where apparently very plausible principles lead to contradictions. And um, the, the dialetheist idea is that <laughs> those contradictions are really t telling us something and, and that as we're in reality there are there simply are if you like black holes of, of contradiction um, and I, I mean their their view is that if you're willing to accept a few contradictions you can actually get a a, a nicer theory overall than than if you avoid contradictions but um, in, in all these cases, it is, po in fact, possible to avoid contradiction. Well, that's what I was going to ask. So uh, what, you would have to have some kind of resolution then to something like the liar's paradox. What Do you have a personal... I mean, your conclusion wouldn't be it's true and it's false. So yeah, what, sure. what do you think is the resolution? Um, so th th there are certain principles uh, about uh, how we apply the concepts of truth and and falsity uh, which in the liar paradox they're actually being ap applied to to sentences and and so they're they're really to do with the way that we handle language um, and i mean if you're a classical logician the way you deal with the the liar paradox is, is you say that we've got we've got to be more careful in the way that we handle language which means that um, we we can't always make the moves that it's quite natural to make most of the time. For example, in talking about which sentences are true, so we can't. You know, in in, in ordinary situations, we'd think that saying the sentence uh, "snow is white" is true is just the same as saying "snow is white," and and so we can make those transitions between talking about truth or just talking about uh, the the world. Uh, 
in in a very automatic way. But the it what the the liar par paradox shows is that those transitions are not as straightforward as we think, and that in fact, uh, in certain circumstances, they've they've got to be restricted uh, w when we're dealing with sentences that may in some subtle way fail to express any real proposition about the world, even yes. though uh, they, they feel meaningful to us. And if you're willing to make those uh, restrictions, then you can handle the liar paradoxes without having to accept any contradictions at all. And, and what I would argue is that in the end, that gives us a better theory than the dialetheists do, because what the dialetheists do is, rather than making their revisions at the level of how we handle language, they they revise the very basic logic, which is a logic that is used in all theorizing whatsoever. Yes. So, for example, all over the, the natural sciences and in mathematics, people are are using logical principles. I mean, they're, they're, they're reasoning with logic because when they come to an inconsistency, then they avoid, then they do something to get out of it and, and so on. And, um, and so what, what the dialetheists are doing is, is forcing us to, to complicate fundamentally all the reasoning that we, that we do because yes. they say that absolutely basic uh, laws of of logic have to be revised. Whereas, it, um, if if you go the classical way, you can you can just keep the standard laws of logic. They don't need to be revised at all, and so we don't need to mess with normal mathematics and normal physics and so on. We all, all we need to mess with are the principles that we use in reasoning about language, about about the way that we apply the concepts of truth and falsity to sentences, and and so that we actually get a uh, a nicer overall view th than you do by accepting contradictions. Would you say something like this, because this is my position, that if you were to allow logical contradictions into your theory, not only is it a demonstration that you've made an error, but it also kind of abandons any type of conceptual coherence. So for example, a dialetheist position that is somehow entertaining the idea of a true contradiction. It's not even really a coherent notion to entertain because you can't have a coherent theory, which is an incoherent theory, which is a theory which includes logical contradictions. Would you say that's too extreme? Well, I mean, you, it's too extreme to suggest that, that dialetheism involves total intellectual anarchy where just anything goes. I mean, dialetheists, they do have some principles of logic that they adhere to, uh, and you know, if you that talk, they don't contradict. They, it's not that they have avoid contradictions, but there are various other principles that that they adhere to. So, um, you know, th there is some discipline to the way that somebody like Graham Priest talks. There is discipline. I think certainly that is the case, in the sense that they sit down and write books and and formally try to develop a theory. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, um, can it be that a theory is internally coherent if it's not internally consistent? Can you, have co like, can, can you say, yes, I fully understand this subject matter, even though within my understanding there's a contradiction? Well, of course, I think it's, I think it's, it's wrong to say that because it, there are no c true contradictions right. on, my, on my view. But... Um, if, if by incoherent you mean something like a, a theory that just totally collapses, then that is not the case for dialetheist theories. Bec I mean, the situation is that I in classical logic, if you have a contradiction, then from the contradiction you can derive any conclusion that you like. And, and so, as it were, all, all, mm -hmm. all hell breaks loose right. when you have a contradiction. Uh, Within dialetheist logic, you can't actually derive very much just from an individual contradiction. And so having a contradiction in your theory does not mean that the theory totally collapses, that it just that anything goes whatsoever. Well, but it's not any it's not any innocent contradiction though, because if it's the case that you permit 
any logical, actual logical contradiction in your theory, that that implies, in principle, that logic has exceptions. Well, it, because it has at least one. That's an exception to classical logic. It's right. not an exception to dialetheist logic. So they, I mean, they they're not having to qualify what they regard as the true logic. Right, which is what? they they just think that cl that classical logic has been erroneously set up as the as the true logic, and that actually a different uh, logic is the true one. Well, this is the one that this is this is great because it's so related to the conversations I've had, because what I was trying to ask um, this professor at Columbia is, is there a way to fully make sense of a sentence that contains a logical contradiction? something just straightforward like, you know, the cat is on the chair and it's not the case that the cat is on the chair. And it seemed like the claim was in dialetheism, yes, you could make some sort of sense to it. Actually, I gave a, uh, here's an a, even better example because I remember exactly the response. I said, is there any way to make sense of a proposition like there's a square circle? Is that something that is coherent? My position, it's not even coherent if you understand the concepts. And he said, sort of, because we can say that square circles are square. Yeah. Well, even from the point of view of a, a classical logician, the, the sentence, there are square circles, uh, it has to be meaningful because it, its negation is true. It's true to say that it's not the case that there are square circles. But if there are square circles was, was just nonsense, then, then negating it would also be nonsense, and so it couldn't be true. Well, so the, it, it, has to, it has to have a meaning, of, but the meaning is just such on a classical view that it can't be true. Well, okay, I guess maybe it depends on what we mean by nonsense, because I, what I would say is if you unpack the concept of square and you unpack the concept of circle, you find these two things are mutually exclusive. So it's like claiming two mutually exclusive things can be put together. Like, yes. Well, that doesn't understand what being mutually exclusive is. Well, the, I think Dialetheus would agree that, in a way, uh, n nothing can be both s square and circular, but they also think that some things are square and circular, and that's a contradiction. But that's a problem, I, though, isn't but it? it? It's, well, it, it's certainly from a classical point of view, it's, <laughs> it's a problem. Okay. Um, but you know, if, if by making sense you mean that it, it's something that, that can be defended in in a way that doesn't involve as a complete madness then then they managed to okay. defend it <laughs> in that, I mean the, depends that on way what that, you mean by complete madness well i mean the, it, it, depending believing in a true contradiction i would say is a pretty good qualifier of complete madness even if you are very composed in in having that belief yeah but I, as you know in fact if you meet <laughs> a dialetheist like like graham priest he's he's considerably uh, saner than for you know for example <laughs> you know uh, holocaust deniers or, okay. <laughs> or people who, who who think that the the world is being run by a conspiracy of lizards or or, or what <laughs> okay <laughs> so well, let me ask you this because there the uh, attack if you will on classical logic doesn't just come from the dialetheist it also comes from other angles do you have i know this is i'm just kind of springing this on you but do you have then a response to the claims of people who come from, let's say, they appeal to quantum physics, and they say quantum physics shows that reality is logically contradictory because reality is in two mutually exclusive, exclusive states at the same time. Do you think that even if they think that's what the evidence shows actually isn't, and there's alternative theories which don't include logical contradictions that should be believed? Yeah. I think that the, the most serious form of, of non-classical quantum logic is not one that includes contradictions, but which it's one which um, does uh, revise certain classical uh, laws of logic. It, it re it, what, what, it, um, what it actually revises is, is the, the law that I if um, X is the case and either Y or Z is the case, then either X and Y is <laughs> the case or uh, X and Z is the case, mm -hmm. uh, which is known as the, one of the distributive laws. Uh, and in the in the nineteen seventies, particularly, people uh, like Hilary Putnam at Harvard, who's who actually just died, uh, uh, put forward uh, quantum quantum logic and a non as a non classical logic and claimed that that we could better understand some of the the 
bizarre results of, of experiments in, in quantum mechanics by adopting this non-classical logic. As far as I can see, th that program of quantum logic has has fundamentally uh, failed, and and Putnam, in fact, uh, with, withdrew his support for quantum oh, really? logic. Uh, um, it, it, it and it's it's failed not not as it were just because it's non-classical, but it, it simply turned out that even if you adopted this uh, n this non-classical logic, it didn't really help you understand the physics any better. Mm -hmm. See, what, what, what the quantum logicians had been claiming was that it was somehow our, our prejudices in favor of classical logic that were preventing us right. from taking quantum reality seriously, and that once we could get rid of these logical prejudices, we'd be able to understand what was going on. But it turned out that just abandoning these classical laws didn't make any more sense of the experiments th than it had before. So as we're for reasons uh, internal to the the physics it just turned out that that going non-classical uh it, in logic was not a, a helpful move in understanding what on earth is going on with quantum reality well so then i have to re-ask the question though i mean does that mean that you're saying the claims coming from physicists or even philosophers saying that quantum physics demonstrates the uh limitations or even even the uh, it demonstrably demonstrates that classical logic isn't as rigorous as we think it is, do you think that they're mistaken? Because there are obviously alternative interpretations of quantum mechanics that doesn't include in, in terms of the Copenhagen interpretation things being here and not here at the same time. There are several different interpretations. Would you say that those are automatically superior just by virtue of the fact that they aren't logically contradictory? Well, I don't think any of the... Um, plausible in interpretations of what's going on in in quantum re reality from a from a, a f the point of view of physics are are ones that involve postulating contradictions i think they they involve these much subtler and milder uh, changes in in logic but 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 of course i prefer the classical logic on purely logical grounds but even if you're willing to to go non-classical uh, in an attempt to understand the puzzles of of quantum mechanics it actually doesn't help you as far as the physics is concerned so there's no real advantage uh, in from a theoretical point of view e even if you as it were start off without any special uh, prejudice in favor of classical logics in in, in doing anything non-classical from a purely logical point of view in uh, the, in quantum mechanics, and so I think it's um, it's just a, a a mistake to think that quantum mechanics provides any support for for non classical logic. It, I mean, it's it, of course it's uh, it's a deeply puzzling area. I don't think anybody denies that, and it's uh, it's very unclear what the the correct account of it uh, is. But there's no reason to think that the correct account involves any meddling with uh, logic itself. Now let me, let me ask you this. If it were true that you had physicists claiming, um, maybe in the future, or let's just say that there was a fundamental theoretical disagreement that uh, the physicists were saying, look, we have evidence of non-classical logic, and it was pitted against classical logic, do you think that there is a uh, is it hubris to say from a, logis a logical standpoint, you've only demonstrated that physicists, you've made an error? So in other words, a lot of people have the intuition that physics has the final say, that physics is kind of the, kind of the bedrock justification for our other beliefs. Other people say that no logic and even philosophy is kind of the bedrock through which we interpret physics. Do you have a response to that? Do you think one is more fundamental than the other? Well. One thing that's very clear about physics is that it depends on mathematics. Physicists are using mathematics all the time. And uh, mathematical reasoning itself depends on logic. Uh, logic is the sort of basic framework within which uh, mathematical reasoning takes place. So it, it's, not, it's not as though the, the physicists are not relying on 
on logic in the in their own work. They're, t they're simply taking logic for granted, and the logic that they're normally taking for granted is classical logic. Now, that doesn't mean that we, we can't conceive of challenges to classical logic coming out of physics. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's, something it's not, like the law of non-contradiction. Yeah. Well, I think, as I say, I think th th that's actually w w the, the the least plausible candidate to be challenged by um, concerns uh, concerns about quantum mechanics. But, but, but it, let's it, but just say, it, but yeah, it's it, it, in some scenario they say, look, this is demonstration of uh, a true contradiction coming from physics. Just in that hypothetical world, you yeah, say I, you don't buy it. So I, I mean, all my instincts. Um, make me utterly skeptical of, of, <laughs> of any such claims. But at the same time, I don't, I don't want to suggest that classical logic has some kind of transcendental justification so that, as it were, j j just by its, its kind of inner glow of rationality or whatever, <laughs> that, that it will automatically trump considerations from anywhere else. And, um, you know, I think that... It, it's not, as where, it's not something that's beyond question. It's it's something that if if we are dealing with very very recalcitrant problems in natural science, and uh, and somebody who who knows what they're talking about suggests that the the best way of of understanding some weird phenomenon is by uh, becoming a uh, skeptical of some classical law. We, I mean, we we can we can look at what arguments they're providing and you know, and see whether they're really they've, they're offering a a better theory. And um, you know, we don't we don't have to go into that um, taking for granted from the beginning that it, there's no way we're ever ever going to al allow modifications of classical logic. But you know, my own my own view is that. When when we when we take these proposals to modify logic seriously, um, we we find that in fact they don't help. But we you know we can we can as we come at look at them in an open minded way. I've done that in a, in a number of areas, including for example the logic of vagueness and um, and these um, non classical logics. They they end up not really having the advantages that are claimed for them. But the best the best way of Arguing that is not by saying that, as when nobody's allowed to question classical logic, is just by looking at what these alternatives are and seeing how they they work, and then seeing what the problems are with them. So, in evaluating a claim that implies a contradiction, by what tools do you would you justify, or by by what tools are you saying this is a plausible evaluation, if you give up? the law of non-contradiction or the law of identity, for example. How, how would you even try to evaluate a proposition as being reasonably true without, without those? Well, w what we're doing is we're comparing alternative theories. W w the, the theories include as it were, logics, uh, I mean, that's, that's one component of them. They may also include various claims about the physical world, if we're thinking of challenges to logic from, uh, from physics. And we, we compare them uh, against each other by normal scientific standards. So we're, we're on, on the one hand, we're looking with, uh, for, to see which theories fit best with the evidence. We're looking at... Uh, which theories are, uh, are simple and elegant, but also which are strong, which which have a lot of explanatory power. Which but, uh, doesn't all of that presuppose, like the law of identity, for example? No, uh, it oh, doesn't. You can, hmm. I mean, the, lo the, the law of the law of identity is you know is a particular uh, logical law that that everything is identical with itself. Um, the, that law is is not being used in um in many logical deductions and and so i mean you can you can entertain isn't the law of identity something that is kind of inescapably presupposed whenever you're coming up with a proposition about anything so if i say you know the reason for physical phenomena x is such and such i'm saying the reason for physical phenomena x is such and such and i'm not saying the reason for physical phenomena x is not such and such right but isn't it something that's 
inescapable. So if any, any proposition you make, you're, not claiming the, you're specifically not claiming the opposite of your proposition. Right? So you're claiming well, my proposition is as it is. You can, I think if you, if you try to, uh, to show that, that the law of identity is being presupposed by things people say, uh, very often you would actually have to um, invoke the law of identity to, to, you know, in trying to argue that it was implied by what they were saying. So that it, um, How could you have an argument that didn't invoke it? Because all arguments are arguments. Yeah, but uh, the fact that, um, I mean, there are actually a number of different things that people mean by <laughs> the law of identity. All arguments okay. are arguments. I mean, one thing is uh, uh, everything that has a property has a property, and um, another is that everything is identical with itself. Those, those uh, uh, turn out not to be exactly the same, the same principle. Um, but for example, you know, even even if you say all arguments are arguments, that's that's something that would be challenged by uh, some logics of vagueness. Um, they, if if it's if it's a bit vague, which things are are arguments, then the, and the, there may be borderline cases for arguments, well, and and um, and. There are non-classical logics of vagueness, and they're not ones that I accept, but they're ones on which um, it, you can't actually assert all, all arguments are arguments. Well, so for borderline cases or vague cases, we could say whatever things are, they are exactly as they are. So if they're a borderline case, then they're they still are what they are. Let, I'll give you an example of like in metaphysics. <laughs> this is funny because somebody actually was trying to demonstrate the, the limitations of classical logic when they, took, when they gave this example. They said, is George Costanza bald? You know George Costanza mm. is in Seinfeld? He's this half bald mm. character. Mm. He's, well, is he bald, is he mm. not bald? And supposedly this is supposed to say, ah, vagueness. Well, this is a vagueness of language, but it's a, not a vagueness of logic, and it's not a vagueness of, of existence. So what we could say is, you know, if we want to be precise, George Costanza has exactly as many hairs on his head as he does. He certainly has no more and he certainly has no less. A is A. Now, where the vagueness comes in is just whether or not we use a word, bald, which is just a subjective evaluation of somebody's um, the amount of hair on their head. Then, yes, I'm fine with that being a spectrum. Some person could say he is bald, some person could say he isn't. No big deal. It doesn't change the idea that he is exactly how he is. There's no vagueness there. Well, even to talk about exactly how many hairs he has on his head may involve vagueness because, uh, I mean, it's, you know, if you pull a hair uh, off his head, there will be a, a point as, as, as it's sort of beginning to rip off where it's, it's a borderline case of being a hair on his head. But I don't head, think so because it, 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 the position of the hair is exactly where it is and it isn't where it isn't. So I don't think reality is infinitely divisible. I think that reality is fundamentally finite and therefore at that point where there's no contact, there's no contact and therefore the hair is removed. Well, w whether reality is infinitely divisible or or not is uh, uh, a matter for for physics. And <laughs> for, I mean, there's no, there's absolutely, no, there's certainly no cl contradiction even in classical logic with assuming, for example, that that time is infinitely divisible. That between any two moments, there's another moment. Well, that's a whole other thing that uh, we'll have to talk about because I, I, I have a very I, I've struggled with the conceptions of infinity. This is one of the things I'm talking about as I'm traveling around. I'm talking yeah. to people about infinity because I think there might be some errors in the way that there's been a mainstream conceptualization of infinity since Cantor. I think there might be some errors there, which is a presumptuous claim, but that's what I think. But I, I do want to keep talking about vagueness if we can because I think it's directly important to, um, to claims about if you can have a, a, arg a counter argument to classical logic that isn't somehow a counter-argument to classical logic. In other words, a counter-argument that doesn't presuppose the law of identity. So with something like, oh, we said arguments. We're not exactly sure what arguments are. Well, what that means is there's some circumstance in which a proposition is not necessarily clear whether or not we categorize it as an argument or not. Well, regardless, it is precisely what it is, and it isn't how it isn't. But there's like a, there's like a taxonomic categorization to say this is an argument or it's not an argument, whether or not there's blurriness there really doesn't make any difference in terms of the laws of identity and non-contradiction. Let me give you one more example, and I'm sorry this is a monologue, but I will let you respond. The example I like to talk about is somebody standing halfway in a doorway. 
Is it the case that they're halfway in the doorway? Yes. Is it the case that they're not halfway in the doorway? Yes. Because you could see, if, you, if we're being imprecise, somebody could say, oh, look, he's halfway in, and it's not the case that he's halfway in because he's halfway out. It's vague. Well, we can very clearly clear that up just by precise communication. Right? So there's no contradiction there. So if, some, if, somebody, if it's true that they are halfway in the doorway, then they are halfway in the doorway, though they may have another half outside of the doorway. I think this is the same case in all cases of vagueness. Just pre precision clears it up. Yeah, I I agree with you because I'm I'm coming from classical logic, but I do think it's important to understand that that there are alternative logics in the sense of alternative theories on which there can be vagueness in reality itself, and and in which. Um, it is not the case that one's uh, always assuming that everything is what it is. Well, can, what do you mean the vagueness in reality itself? It was that, that things could somehow be ways they aren't? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a matter of, of uh, a contradiction. It can just be that... That they, are, um, they aren't some way. That it's, it, I mean, the view is that it's indeterminate how they are. Yes, but isn't that an evaluation of our knowledge of something? So there may be some finite amount of particles that exist, and we may not know what it is, but that doesn't mean reality is vague. That, that, that is a, an issue about our, our knowledge and ignorance. It's, that's my view of vagueness, but it, it's, it's not the view that some other pe people have. And um, although I think they're, they're wrong, I don't think that their view it just collapses into... Uh, complete nonsense or anything like that. It's it, it it's a theory that you know you can you can work with. As I say, I think it's a mistaken theory, but I you know I, I don't think that one should underestimate underestimate one's opponents. Okay, so this is great. This is awesome. I'm really enjoying this because I have yet to have a conversation that has talked specifically about this. I'm writing a book right now on this topic, and I want to run an idea about you in real time. So my claim is that existence by what we mean by the concept of existence implies perfect precision it implies identity that you cannot have existence without identity so to the extent that we have existence it is certainly the case that we have existence and therefore we have identity existence is existence therefore identity so so any claims that you can have existence without identity doesn't make any sense what do you think about that idea well Again, I think it depends what you mean by doesn't make any sense. I mean, it, it, it is it, internally inconsistent. Um, so existence implies identity. Do you think that that is, what do you think? I mean, I, well, my own view is that it's true that, that whatever exists is identical with itself. So, uh, and that's as well, that's a standard classical view. But, yeah. but you could, uh, in fact, have a, a, cons a consistent view. I think it would be a wrong-headed one, but it, it would it, it would be consistent in the sense that it wouldn't just end up uh, implying absolutely everything, which uh, w which said that that um, some things are not self-identical. And in fact, even within classical logic, you can prove that such a view is consistent, uh, consistent in the sense that it that. You could develop such a view without, without ever just ending up just saying absolutely everything. So uh, um, it sounds like your criteria for determining incoherence is that you could say absolutely everything. My criteria for incoherence is some kind of internal contradiction. But when you, when you gave the example of some things might not be themselves, what I would say is what do you mean by things? Because what I think you mean by things or what anybody means by things is existent things. And if that's true, then it implies they are exactly as they are. Well, but what you're relying on there is a certain principle of classical logic. It's a principle that that I accept. Uh, <laughs> I think it's it is a principle of the the best logic that that we have. But it's it's important to understand that it, it is possible to formulate alternative theories. I mean, you, you know, it's important to know what you're up against. I agree. And, I agree. Um, you know, and when, when we're talking about what, whether a view makes sense, 
Um, if you just say, well, uh, that you're going to regard any view that, that implies a contradiction as not making sense, um, then people will w w are likely to reply, well, all right, you can use the, f the, the phrase doesn't make sense in that way if you like, but then, then maybe we should take seriously some theories that, in your, that uh, as <laughs> you would put it, sense. don't make sense. <laughs> uh, because actually, you, you know, it is possible to work with such theories uh, b because th they, they, they don't end... Uh, end up saying just absolutely everything. I mean, that's the, but the it's thing it's possible is to work with them in the sense that you can work with the assumption that one plus one equals three. You can work with that in the sense that you can, you can make all kinds of theories. Technically speaking, you write all kinds of books, but that doesn't mean that it makes sense. Well, it's, it, it makes sense at the very least it, in that it's meaningful. Bec and because I mean, one pl even one plus one equals three is is m meaningful. I it's not just um, complete uh, gobbledygook, but um, because um, it's n it's negation is true. It's true to say that one plus one is not equal to three, but that that can only be true if it's negating something which itself is meaningful. And so that means that one plus one equals three has to be meaningful. And so you can have these alternative theories, which which are meaningful, even though um, they they may be, from our point of view, ridiculous. And okay. um, I mean, the you know the question the question is is whether there's any reason for taking them seriously. And it, you know, in the in the case of logical paradoxes, um, they do provide a bit of a reason for taking some of these very strange alternative views seriously because l l the logical paradoxes are really hard to solve mm -hmm. and w whatever I is the correct view of them, it's going to be pretty strange because we've tried all the non-strange things and none of them work. Right. <laughs> uh, so that, so well, we, we, you know, we have to be w willing to, to take seriously some pretty weird theories uh, you know, just just in order to to do justice to the depth of these problems, and and some of these theories m may involve s saying things that are mad. As I say, I, in the case of logic, I don't in fact think that we need to go all the way to contradictions. But uh, you know, the, the well, the case of infinity that you mentioned before is that's a case where um, we've developed theories or Cantor developed <laughs> theories which have become a part of absolutely standard mathematics uh, which do contradict things that people regarded as self-evident before. I mean, for example, that it, in some sense the, the a, a part of a thing a, a, um, can be the same size as the whole thing and um, and and so you know, we've we've had to to revise our ideas about what's really obvious. Well, why wouldn't you conclude then that Cantor was wrong? Well, I think the um, the, the success of um, of modern mathematics is 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 pretty clear indication that that Cantor was was not uh, uh, on the uh, the wrong track. Well, what do you mean by success? Well, it's um, b but both its its role in um, you know, providing the mathematical framework for the the, the rest of science, and uh, it's uh, it, it's never uh, Cantor's uh, set theory when once it's rigorously developed it does not involve any contradictions. I mean, certainly nobody's ever found any contradictions. Even in something like a part being the same size as the whole, you would say, is not a contradiction. There's no co there's no contradiction there because it's not it's not of the the form something is the case and it's not the case. You you cannot derive well, anything of, of you know. But it's conceptually contradictory. So what we mean by the term part and what we mean by the term whole implies unequalness. Well, unequalness in the sense of it's not they're not uh, identity, but it doesn't it doesn't imply a difference in size. And um, you know, I th w what what Cantor did was to 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 take apart a, a number of different things that were lumped together in kind of vague, ordinary discussion of parts and wholes and bigger and smaller and so on. Uh, he separated them very carefully and uh, showed how w we can reason in a completely consistent way about uh, as well the different components of them. And uh, I mean, we now have 
the theory of um, finite and infinite sets, and we've also got uh, logics of part and whole. And, uh, and w when we put all these sorts of things together, uh, we, d we don't get any contradictions, and we can maintain that there are, are things which are the, um, the same size as one of their uh, uh, parts that's less than the whole. And I mean, there are simple examples of that. So that, uh, if, you know, if you take the natural numbers, not one, two, three, four, five, and um, and then you take the 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 even numbers, not two, four, six, eight. Uh, I mean, the, the, they can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence but, with but, each other. There are the, sa the, the same number of uh, of each, even though the the even numbers are just a proper part of the the natural numbers. So, so let me ask. Uh, let me ask you. That. I do want to go. I have a, another question. I want to ask you about certainty, but this is yeah. mathematics is so relatable to this. Okay. If it were the case that there could be a logic which did not allow for, uh, or, or which could demonstrate the errors in Cantor's set theory, and specifically his diagonal proof, do you think that would be superior in terms of uh, logical palability to the conclusions that we find in set theory? So for example, what I, this is my honest belief that I think the way that Cantor went about doing that mis does not understand the nature of numbers. So he, Cantor was a Platonist, so when the way that he's formulating his questions take all the natural numbers. I don't think you can do that. I don't think numbers work that way. Numbers are something that are conceptual. So you take exactly as many numbers as you conceived of. You can have, they have, so those numbers can have certain properties. And there's no, there's no infinite here. So the, the diagonal proof doesn't work because, in, in a sense, all sets are necessarily finite because they are conceptual. They aren't existent out there separate of our conception of them. And we can't conceive of an actual infinite. So therefore, as he's working through his diagonal proof, and every one, every one of the lines, it has dot, dot, dot. And I have an issue with the dot, dot, dot because it implies something that there's an actually existent infinite amount of numbers out there, and I don't think I don't think that's the case. I think numbers are conceptually created. And by conceptually created, do you think that they're created by our minds or something? Yeah, right? yeah, they're they're concepts. One is not something that's out there. One is a concept. I think there are ideas, and there are what the ideas are of, and. Um, I mean, there's there's the number one and there's a the concept of the number one, but those are those are uh, the distinct. I don't think thing. they are. I think that that is the presupposition of Platonism that one is out there, separate of our conception of it, and I don't think that makes sense. I think it's the same thing. The analogy I use, just you know, we're in England, is Harry Potter, right? Does what is the the ontological status of Harry Potter? Well, if nobody conceived of him, he would have no existence. He has no, no existence out there. And to the extent he exists, it's only as a product of people thinking, but J.K. Rowling sitting down and writing, you know, thinking about him. He exists in the conceptual world. We can say things like Harry Potter has circular glasses. Yeah, that's a true statement. But we have to bracket it and say, in terms of the mental world, if nobody can ever conceived of him, that wouldn't, that wouldn't even make sense. The same is true, I think, of numbers. Numbers have the exact same type of existence as fictional characters. They they do not exist when we're not thinking about them. Yeah, but there's a there's a, a difference because it would be ridiculous to try to use the fictional character of Harry Potter to explain what happened a million years ago before J.K. Rowling uh, uh, ever wrote the books. But in the case of mathematics, we we use numbers in doing physics, but and we use them to explain yeah. events that happened millions of years yes, ago. Yes, but these aren't arbitrary concepts. It's not fiction. Uh, maybe I, that, maybe that, I'm glad you brought that up. Maybe I won't use that example because that implies something I don't mean to imply, that they're just capricious, that it's just some fanciful notion that we come up with that's useful. I would say they're conceptual, but their grounding is in logic. One is a, it's a logical concept. Amount, quantity, is something that is a logical concept that can have an actual direct reference to existent phenomena in reality. So if I say there's one, you know, microphone here, that means something very, very concrete that we can, we can, and we can abstract from it. So we can say oneness is nice to think about in the abstract. You can apply it to all sorts of different areas, even a million years in the past, but it doesn't exist when it's not being conceived of. It's a conceptual, logical tool. 
So this is where I think um, the project of Bertrand Russell um, was well was justified in trying to in to ground all of mathematics in logic. I think that's I think that's true. I think you you can I think all of mathematics follows from logical principles. Yeah, but. It, it, you're on dangerous ground in invoking Bertrand Russell because well, I know, he, he, I know. he said that that, that <laughs> that's to where do, he went wrong. To, <laughs> to do logic uh, uh, properly, you have to have uh, a, a sense of reality and that the the, the the kind of things that we're dealing in with logic yeah, and mathematics yes, yes. have as much it, reality as those that we're dealing with in zoology. I, I completely agree. Yes, yes. Uh, this is funny. I was just talking to um, Dr. Isaacson about this. That I think the uh, uh, this is sounds contradictory, but I think uh, my own philosophy incorporates uh, logicism and intuitionism, which seem like they're mutually exclusive, but I think there are good parts in both, like the rejection of infinite sets and in terms of the metaphysics of mathematics being something that's conceptual. But unfortunately, in the intuitionists thought that that meant the laws of identity as well as just this conceptual thing. Oh, so we come up with it, and then it's not referenced to something that's out there in reality. I think that's mistaken. So, so in my own view, okay. Well, let me let me ask you this. Rather than diving into that, let me ask you this: If it were the case that what I'm saying is accurate about the metaphysical nature of numbers, that ne I think it necessarily implies that there's not an infinite amount of them in the sense that there's an actual infinite. It means that you can conceive of a number greater than a number that you've already thought of. Yes, certainly. But that doesn't mean that there's an actual infinite out there. And I think it does imply that in no sense can you have a whole that is the same size as one of the parts of the whole. And it also implies you can't, then therefore you can't have different sizes of infinite sets because that idea is not, is not even sensible. Don't you think all of that it, it all follows from this particular metaphysical conception of mathematics? Well, it's hard to to say what follows from it because it. I think you're you're uh, oscillating between um, c conceiving of something, uh, I mean, the something that you're conceiving, and the and the conceiving of it, and yeah. Um, but I, those are different. Those are different things. But, but and I, they're I, different. They're just. It, you have to make that distinction it, for. Um, mathematical thought just as for any other kind of thought. There's what you're c conceiving and there's the conceiving of it. So what do you think about the existence of, uh, of when we're talking about Harry Potter? Does, does he exist? There's a fictional character, Harry Potter, who is, cre that is, not, a per is not a boy but uh, is a kind of cultural construct that was created by J.K. Rowling. Yes. What is its existence? Where if nobody would have, have thought of that construction, well, it, any then it would have existence. been uh, a, a merely possible fictional character. What is the status of a possible fictional character? What is the actual status of one? Is it existent or not? Depends what you mean by existent, but it's, it's, it's self-identical. Yeah, but it's not. It wouldn't be anything. It, 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 would, be, it would be something. It would be a, a, possi so, a possible fictional character. So, That's something. So, so, so would you say that all possible fictional characters have existence, have some type of in existence? A, in a... In a uh, a thin logical sense of existence, yes. Really, all every so so the 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 books that are written a million years from now with characters that we know nothing of, they have some type of existence to them. Yes, but you have to understand that that existence doesn't have to be in space and time. It doesn't have okay, to be where, concrete. But, but where is it? So well, you're saying where, but I just said it doesn't have to be in space. So you say you you think that future concepts that have never been conceived have a non-spatial existence. All future concepts. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to laugh at you. That um, Doesn't that strike you as absurd? No. All, all possible conceits. So, for, so the, the, uh, well, the everything, look, everything exists. I mean, that's, I mean, Quine made this point that that's, that's trivial. And if by exist, you just mean being something, then, then whatever there, all of anything exists because, because everything is something. So, so. A thousand years from now, somebody reads the Harry Potter books, and they misread them, and they think Harry Potter has square glasses. That concept of Harry Potter with square glasses that nobody would ever have thought about, prior to that conception of it, even if it's 10,000 years, and take any misreadings of Harry Potter, that particular concept with one little, the shoelace is tied differently, that still has a real non-spatial existence. A misreading is something that happens. 
and that was it was a possible misreading all along so that is one theory but don't wouldn't you find it much more uh, persuasive or or comfortable to say it is not the case that all possible concepts have any type of existence that concepts do not exist prior to their conception and they do not exist after their conception they are entirely dependent on our active conceptualization of them yeah but if if you're saying there are some concepts that don't exist is that is that what you're saying no i'm saying at the at the point of conception co that concept exists so so it's like um uh, there's no concept which exists separate of it being conceived that's what i'm saying by virtue of what we mean by a concept i would say no, I don't think. I think that's that's not not right. I mean, it, a concept is something that can, that um, is a way. Uh, it's a way of conceiving something. Like the concept, the the concept of uh, of London. Let's say. It, I mean, it's a, a way of thinking of London. I yes, suppose. but there's no and ways of thinking of London without the mind, right? So you wouldn't have the concept of London without thinking of London. It was still there was a as it were the notional possibility of thinking of London uh, was there all along in a real metaphysical way has some type of real existence. Yes. This is a this is I feel like we could talk a whole, a whole <laughs> series on that. Okay, w one more question though. Um, this is just a hard geared shift back to what we were talking about before. When you were saying we have to entertain the idea of even potentially giving up the law of non contradiction. Even though it seems implausible, we have to. Enter. Does that mean, in your worldview, there is no room for certainty? There's no room for absolute certainty. I th there are plenty of things that we can be confident of that we don't w that we don't have to um, as what to worry about to um, to en entertain doubts about. That, um, and if if that's enough for certainty, then certainty is fine. But if by certainty you mean that there are some things that in no circumstances would it be reasonable to doubt them, then I don't think that there's anything as certain in that sense. Uh, um, that for any, for any proposition that, that you like, there are, there are circumstances in which a, a reasonable, open-minded person w would doubt them. Okay, so can I rephrase that? Uh, uh, would you accept this rephrasing? That your position is certainty as understood as 100% confidence in the accuracy of some proposition, of any proposition. And the belief that there's not even a conceivable possible way for that proposition to be false. Is that what you're saying? You reject that idea? Yeah. If, if what we're talking about is a kind of dogmatic disposition such that whatever came along, it would not tempt you to, to call something into, into doubt. I, th I, I think that's, that kind of disposition is not an appropriate one. Uh, to have. Okay, so let me ask you this. Um, if somebody were to say, so let's, let's say I were, I were to claim Dr. Williamson is dogmatic. Dr. Williamson believes that you can have absolute certainty, as is the way I just described it. You would say this is a false claim. Would you say you're certain that that's a false claim? No, I'm not certain that it's a false claim. I do. Um... I mean, that particular claim that I'm not, uh, that, that, that I, I'm uh, not dogmatic. I, you know, I think all of us should should worry a bit about whether we're being dogmatic. So I guess what I'm getting at is, if for your own internal state, your own internal state of mind. So you're having the perception of being in a conversation right now. If somebody were to claim right now that it, you are not having the perception of having this conversation right now, would you say you're certain that they're wrong? Or I'm certain by ordinary standards that they're wrong. But you're not absolutely but, but, certain. But I mean, I think w w what you're probably building into the idea of absolute certainty is an absolutely dead set disposition, never to call something into, into doubt. Mm -hmm. And, well, in the, in the case of the claim that 
that I'm having this uh, this conversation. Um, you know, it, ten years from now, I uh, I may be in considerable doubt about whether I had any such conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not ten years from now. I'm saying right now. So, so you have some quality to your experience. You know, let's say you ate a strawberry and you're having the experience of eating a strawberry. What I'm saying is, can you be absolutely certain? that you're having that experience. Not necessarily that the strawberry exists or anything like that, just that the contents of your perception exist in the present. Can you have certainty about that? Well, you can know such things. And I mean, you can be, you can be uh, reasonably confident of them. You, you don't need, I mean, there's no special reason for having any doubts about them. But if, if you mean that, you can have a disposition such that um, under no circumstances will you entertain any doubts about them. For example, um, you, you will not for a moment take seriously some, um, some philosophical view on, on which uh, consciousness is, is some kind of myth or, or whatever, then I, I think uh, th that that is not a good sort of disposition to to have. What, um, I think one's one's got to have a a disposition to that allows one to question things that one has been completely confident of. Um, of course, you know, if if one just if as soon as anybody just raises a question, one one throws oneself into into terminal doubt then i mean that's obviously a bad disposition to have but the but the ability to to see things from a point of view that is inconsistent with your own is an important one to have what about the middle ground the middle ground being for virtually nothing i am absolutely certain virtually nothing however there is a small limited set of things which i have absolute indubitable certainty one of them is the contents of my present experience couldn't possibly, what I would say is it couldn't, anybody that were to claim that it is not the case that I'm having some perception right now would, is necessarily wrong. I, there, it is certainly the case that perception is a real phenomena that is happening in the universe. I'm certain of it. And I couldn't be wrong about it because I'm having, I have direct knowledge about that. And I would also say that that kind of certainty applies to certain mathematical truths and logical truths. But outside of that, there's not, there's not many areas where you get that kind of certainty. Do you think that's an, uh, an elf, unhel a dogmatic or unhealthy way of thinking about philosophy? Well, if you take, if you take the case of logical truths, uh, th there are plenty of logical truths that I'm quite confident of, I, that I think I know, and I think lots of people know them. But at the same time, I don't just dismiss out of hand theories like dialetheism, which uh, which question or, or reject uh, those, those logical laws. Um, of course, there's no point in, in being interested in questioning that doesn't give any reasons for questioning, because, I mean, any, you know, anything whatsoever can be questioned, and, and uh, we'd never get anywhere if, if we just questioned things, uh, as it were, for, n for no particular reason. But, I mean, the, the, case, the case of logic has, has shown that quite intelligent reasons can be given. Intelligent, well-informed reasons can be, be, be given for things that we thought were indubitable. And um, that progress has been made by a willingness to, to doubt things that we previously took for, for granted. And, um, and so a, a good intellectual disposition to have is one that, that is willing to question things um, when intelligent, well-informed reasons for questioning them are provided. Of course, it may be that the things that are being questioned are things that actually are true, and re you know, on reflection, we realize even that we know that they're true. But um, the thing is, if if you have a disposition to uh, to hold certain things above doubt, no matter what happens. Uh, the effect of that is that there are probably a whole lot of false things that you believe that you're going to hold beyond doubt. I mean, for example, in the days of slavery, people might have held the, the proposition that, that slavery is morally acceptable as something that was beyond doubt. Well, I think on that note, uh, 
thank you very much for talking to me. This has been an awesome conversation. Well, thank you. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. All right, so that was my interview with Dr. Timothy Williamson of Oxford University. If you guys are interested in what we're talking about, check out the show notes page this week, steve-patterson.com slash 16. I'll have a link to Dr. Williamson's books, to my upcoming book, and I'll also have a link to an article that I just wrote. This is the longest article I've written on my site about a topic that we mentioned here, which we talked about mathematics and this guy, Georg Cantor, who revolutionized the world of mathematics by claiming that there were infinite sets and there were, in fact, different sizes of infinite sets, that some infinities are bigger than others. My own evaluation is I'm not persuaded by that argument. In fact, I think his argument is pretty poor, and contrary to the very kind and friendly disposition of Dr. Williamson, I take a very aggressive stance against uh, Cantor's claims. So if that sounds interesting to you, that will be also at the show notes page, my own attempt at refuting Cantor. And make sure to tune in next week where I'm going to be doing a breakdown episode and I'm going to spend a lot of time on this interview because there's so many nuggets of wisdom that need to be highlighted and expanded upon. And if you liked this interview and you want more discussion about rationalism and logic, then do me a favor and check out my Patreon page. You can support this show by going to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson and pledging $1 of support whenever I post new content like this. It helps make these interviews possible. Plus, you'll also get a free copy of all the books I've written and all the books I will write in the future. All right, that's it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed it and have a fantastic week. 